to episode 203 of the Cricket Her Weekly. A week in which South Africa beat Australia for the first time ever in an ODI. Last week it was a T20, this week an ODI, next week a test, Sid. Well, it's definitely possible. <laughs> So, I've got a series nicely poised now. Yeah. If South Africa did win the test, it would mean... I mean, they, they, South Africa can't win the actual like trophy anymore. Trophy that Raf is politely referring to as the satellite dish. <laughs> it's very nice satellite dish. It's a lovely but it does bear a striking <laughs> resemblance to something that you see on people's roofs. So South Africa can't win it outright anymore, but they can tie the series, mm. um, which would, of course, because there's nobody, I guess nobody's kind of retaining this trophy, so that would mean the show trophy would be shared, which is interesting. Oh, that could be intriguing. Yeah, so um, South Africa won that second ODI quite comprehensively. I think it was by 84 runs um, on the DLS method. Um, and But the, the striking thing about it was Australia actually being all out. They were bowled out for 150-odd, um, which is probably, of the matches that they've lost, this is probably their poorest performance. Yeah, no, they, they, it, it wasn't a good day at the office for Australia. I mean, it does have to be said, you know, you could, that they came back in the third and they kind did. of, you know, <laughs> tonked South Africa back and South Africa, you know, got, got beat even worse in the third match. I mean, what it shows is kind of what you were saying last week, Raph, that yeah. Australia are vulnerable, but they're still, I mean, they're still the best team in the world. Yeah. And they'll still, you know, come back and if you punch them, they'll come back and punch you back, definitely. Um, but it was a great day for South Africa. And, yeah. you know, they, they basically bowled really well. They put themselves into a position where they could win the match. And then they kind of sealed the deal. And that's what they, really what they didn't do in the third ODI. The third ODI, they, there was definitely a point, um, you know, during the first innings where you felt, you know, South Africa are kind of on top here. South Africa were bowling. You know, they, they'd taken a load of key wickets. Um, but in the end, Beth Mooney kind of, you know, it's kind of battled through a, a slightly difficult period and, uh, you know, supported that late middle order, that long late middle order that Australia have got. And Joe, they just put on too many runs and then South Africa kind of folded in the face of a chase that they probably weren't going to make anyway. Um, you know, so Australia remained the best, but that, that vulnerability, you know, has come back again. Yeah, it's and really... I think that result's important because ODIs are often said to be Australia's strongest format. Um, and so actually them being beaten that badly in an ODI um, is almost kind of worse than being beaten in a T20, where oftentimes people just go, oh, well, it's T20 cricket, anything can happen. Now, Sid, I know that you, your stats don't bear that out, um, but actually it just felt like being beaten that badly at home in an ODI, um, really a lot of people are now jumping on board that it's it's really the end of the 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 era of Australian dominance bandwagon that I've been on since July. Um, anyway, um, what I thought was interesting or is interesting about, because you talked about the series now being kind of poised as they go into the test, is actually the way they've structured this multi-format series, because I don't believe we've ever had a women's ashes where we've had the test at the end. It's always been either at the start or between the two white ball legs of the series. Um, and there was a lot of talk last summer after um, Australia won the test um, and then kind of went into the rest of the series with those four clear points, people saying, oh, well, um, you know, that made the rest of the series or that initially people saying that made the rest of the series inevitably um, Australia's ashes. Well, actually, England fought back quite well in the end. Although um, Australia still retained the ashes. They of did, yeah. But people talk about having the, there was talk about people moving, or there was talk about the test being moved to the back end of the Ashes. And so that's kind of what they've done with this South Africa series. I don't know how deliberate it's been or whether it was about when they could get a test ground available in the Australian summer, um, but it's an interesting one because we are now going into the test with, as you say, a situation where actually Australia um, are kind of ahead in the series, um, but if they lost this test, then they could end up drawing the series. Will that inevitably encourage negative tactics? Well, I hope not. And I think that the, the kind of backloading those those big points is kind of interesting. And it's the thing yeah. that game shows do, isn't it? If you watch TV game shows, when they have like double points, it's always like the last round is double points because yeah. it gives someone a chance to catch up. And that's kind of makes it more exciting for the audience. People that people that make TV game shows have done their homework, right? You know, they know what they're doing. Yeah, they do. So, you know, I think that it is kind of interesting. And it's, you know, even though South Africa, you know, have 
um, lost both of the both the T20 and the ODI series. They've won a match in each one, and it does give them that chance to still, you know, kind of end end the entire thing on as even. So I think that that's great because it keeps the test exciting. Mm -hmm. And South Africa will certainly, you know, have every incentive to try and win it. South Africa won't be trying to kill the game, that's for sure. No, absolutely. Yeah, so it'll be interesting to see whether that influences the structure of the next Ashes and when they um, when they yeah. schedule the test for in that. Um, Having said that, I do think that um, Australia must be odds-on favourites to win the test. I don't know whether you agree, Sid, um, purely because it's been kind of 18 months or something since South Africa actually played the test. I think the last one they played was that one against England at Taunton in 2022, when they actually, they didn't lose, um, but largely speaking because of rain. Having said that, <laughs> Marizan Cap did have a very good test that time around. So she's going to be the really crucial player for South Africa, you would think. Yeah, um, and she's she's been in some great form, but the other side of yeah. the coin is she's spent a lot of time off the field, it feels like. And, uh, you know, is, is she in a place where she's going to make it through, you know, four days of test cricket? I mean, I guess that, you know, if you're kind of cynical as, you know, as professionals are want to be, and not unreasonably, then you know you can kind of manipulate the 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 situation in a test, which allows you to bring a player off and then have them off the period for a certain number of overs. And you know, you know as long as you're careful and you keep an eye on what you're doing, then you know you won't wind up with too much of a penalty for that. So they you know they can have a bowler spell and then come off for a bit and get a massage and then come back on the field. You know. <laughs> But you do have to be slightly concerned about given how much time, she, how many times in the last few weeks we've seen, oh, you know, she's an injury risk, she's, she hasn't felt well, she's mm -hmm. felt tightness here, tightness there. So well, that's going to be they, key I think they need to be wrapping her in bandages and giving her as many ice baths as it takes in order to get her on the field. Because I think without her, South Africa's chances um, look much weaker. She's clearly their best player at the moment in all departments. Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, it's in the same way as England would miss Nat Siver or, yeah. you know, Australia would miss... Australia have been very dependent in these white ball series on Beth Mooney. Beth Mooney's scored an extraordinary amount of runs compared to everyone else, especially as Phoebe Litchfield's had a, uh, kind of a terrible yeah. white ball experience yeah. in this series. It's almost like the difficult second series. Obviously, not her second series, really, but... It, <laughs> She's yeah, there was all of that hype of about her at the beginning yeah. of the year. She then won that, was it the ICC award that she won? Emerging and then, own. now this has happened. But it happens to everybody, doesn't it? Um, you just have to try and roll with the punches in professional cricket. Yeah, absolutely. I guess from Cap's perspective as well, like this is going to be probably the only chance in her career that she's going to get to play a test at ground that is actually notorious for being friendly for fast bowling. So from her perspective, she'll be absolutely desperate to play. So let's hope that she does. Uh, the test, of course, starting on Thursday. Um, Australia have announced their squad, Sid, um, and it's an interesting one. Um, 14 players, um, so three of those selected won't play. Um, perhaps quite a spin-heavy squad, would you say? Yeah, they've selected five spinners in the squad, haven't they? And um, I don't know whether this is because they think they're going to be going in you know, with, with perhaps three spinners. I mean, they've definitely got to go in with two. Um, so I mean I'm including Ash Gardner here as a as a spinner because she will be you know she's basically a full a full proper all rounder she'll be yeah. expected to, to bowl potentially a lot of overs. Well, look the, at the load that she bowled at Trent Bridge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you know that five spinners going in, but you'd think they'd probably leave a couple of them out. Um, but there's a little bit of a, an interesting thing with the fast bowling. I think that's where the, the interesting selections are. We've got um, Darcy Brown, Kim Garth, and Megan Shute. Um, now, Megan Shu hasn't played a test since 2019, mm. um, so that's nearly five years yeah. she hasn't played a test. She's also actually come out explicitly and said, um, I'm not, I don't really want to play test cricket, that's not my bag anymore, it, it goes on a long time and I get, um, I, think she, uh, I hope I'm not, she kind of said I, I get a bit bored by it, didn't she, I think. Yes, I think that she did say that, yeah. So um, but basically, all, put all, no, all of the noises that have come out of her uh, in the last few years suggest that actually she's kind of feels that she's done with test cricket um, which is fair enough it's a it's a tough format yeah. but I mean it's like okay so they've got their two fast bowlers you think that pre presumably both of them will play but it's just again it's indicative of their lack of fast bowling resources really I mean they've got a lot of uh, they've got the all-rounders of course so they've got um you know Sutherland uh, and McGrath Roth, and Perry, um, Perry. Of <laughs> so you know that, that's a lot of all-round options yeah. who who bowl will kind of seem up as well but um I, going beyond that, I mean, it was really interesting to hear Elise Villani talking on commentary when they were talking about, you know, and they were kind of trying to be positive, like, oh, yeah, we've got great depth in fast bowling yeah. because we've got Taylor Lennox, she's coming back from injury, 
And it's like, well, that's your depth, Taylor yeah. Fleming. I mean, you know, he's clearly not going to be fit to play kid, in the international she's for quite injured. a long time. You know, yeah. is she ever? So, I mean, I don't think they have that many fast bowling resources. And the fact that they've picked Shoot, I don't, I don't almost think Shoot won't play. I'm guessing Shoot won't play. Uh, my guess is that Sophie Molyneux won't play. I mean, she's the kind of the other comeback and a kind of interesting selection that she hasn't played for a while. She did captain the Governor General's eleven in the warm up against South Africa. So it shows she was in the thinking. Yeah, but, but on the other hand, it totally underlines your point about lack of depth in fast bowling, that actually um, they're kind of looking around going, oh, well, who can we bring into our squad for the test? We're playing at the Wacker, which, as we've just said, is this ground that's meant to be a haven for fast bowling. Oh, yeah. um, instead, in instead, of bringing in, um, instead of bringing in Brianna Bowler, um, we're going to bring we're going to recall Sophie Molyneux, a spinner. That's a bit of an odd thing, isn't it? Because you'd think if they had all of these fast bowlers just round the corner who they think are about to come through and burst onto the scene, that, that's who they'd be bringing into their squad and they haven't. So I think that's a bit odd. And actually, it is a bit of a contrast with where South Africa are at, at the moment. They've got these two young um, fast bowlers who uh, bowled really well in that second ODI. So Marks, um, whose uh, first name escapes me, but will forevermore on the Cricket Her Weekly be known as Carl. Um, <laughs> and Halubi is the other one who also bowled really well the other day. Um, of course, they've also got um, their their other um, yeah, fast bowlers. Yeah, Class has had a really decent tour. Um, you know, she's been moving the ball around, so that's been a, that's been a big positive for them as well. So they've definitely got those resources that can take potentially take advantage of, yeah. uh, of a friendly pitch at the Wacker. There's been some really interesting other news, actually, um, that's been announced this week in relation to the future of Red Bull cricket um, in Australia, Sid. Um, they've actually said that they're going to play an annual um, Red Bull three-day game, um, and they, they're terming it the Green v the Gold. Um, and so they're going to have this as bringing together, I guess, the, the leading um, state cricketers um, to play this annual three-day fixture. Um, so I suppose it's sort of partly as a way of um, kind of prepping them for, for potentially playing test cricket. But it is also interesting that instead of just saying we're having this fixture, they've actually explicitly said this is going to be something that we do every year. Yeah, I mean, we did have this uh, one that was scheduled last year that ended up sort of sort of happening and sort of not happening because it got it got rained off. It, it, this is the one in England last year. It got rained off and then they rescheduled it as a one day thing. Okay, so that was the, that, yeah, that was in but, England, the regional yeah. um, game. Um, but we haven't had any, any information about about such a thing happening this year. Okay. Um, so, you know, whereas Australia have come out and gone, we are going to do this yeah. and we're going to make a thing of it and we're going to do it next year as well. I mean, I suppose just because they said they're going to do it next year doesn't mean they actually will, but they're kind of trying to make it a thing in the calendar. I think they are. Um, and the, the contrast with what's happening in England is actually that this is very much being driven from the top by Cricket Australia, who have obviously got the CEO now in Nick Hockley, who really believes that test cricket, women's test cricket, is important, right? And we've we've sung his praises before in relation to this. So they've got this CEO now. Um, and so it's kind of being driven from the top and they're saying, right, how can we prepare our players um, to be playing more test cricket? Um, whereas in England, that three-day match that you talked about that sort of didn't happen because of rain last summer um, was being driven from the bottom by the regions. It wasn't really anything to do with the ECB. And as far as I'm aware, the ECB don't really have any plans. And so it's not been mentioned in relation to Project Darwin, for example. They're not expecting the counties to write Red Bull fixtures or any kind of Red Bull prep into these um, tenders for the new teams. So that's that's kind of a little bit of something that the regions were doing on a kind of ad hoc basis. Um, so that's the difference, actually. So Australia, once again, leaping ahead of the rest of the world there, I think, a little bit. Yeah, and the rest of the world needs to take notice because, you know, they're giving another, you know, 22 players here the chance to have that, that experience, that, yeah. that, you know, that Red Bull and his full three-day game as well. The one last year in England that was scheduled was only scheduled for two days as right. well. So. well, there you go. So that's another difference. Um, and um, another interesting bit of news this week, this isn't in relation to Red Bull cricket, um, but it does relate to what we were talking about earlier in terms of um, Australia, South Africa, Sid. Apparently, um, I didn't actually see this, um, but Donna Van Neerkirk said, um, she was interviewed during one of the ODIs, I believe, and she said that she is planning to try to get back into the South Africa team. Did you see that? Wow, I didn't see the interview, no. Okay. Um, but yeah, so, she, she wants back. I mean, you hear, you hear sports people say it, 
sometimes that retirement is the hardest thing they ever had to do. Maybe she's yeah. finding retirement too hard. She she misses the the excitement. Yeah. She misses being part of the action. It does seem a bit of an about turn because she did do that lap of honour at the Oval after the 100 last year and you very much felt like that was her kind of saying goodbye to elite cricket. Um, and the other kind of thing is that um, when all of this uh, stuff kicked off about her being dropped from the South Africa team because of failing that fitness test, she did do some um, some interviews and she was quite critical of Cricket South Africa. So I feel like um, somehow um, she's managed to unburn that bridge and whether it's come from her or whether actually it's to do with Hilton Mareng, the coach who um, has been announced is kind of moving on ahead of the World Cup. Um, has she had a well, meeting? It has to be said that he's announced that he's been announced that he's been moving <laughs> on several times before and well, he hasn't moved yeah. on. Um, but I mean, that, that relationship was obviously a difficult one, right? I don't think that we're saying anything at, um, that we're saying anything that hasn't been publicly uh, kind of yes. accepted. Um, you know, has somebody from Cricket South Africa reached out to Donna and said, look, we, we made a mistake here, are bad, please will you come back, but you just might need to do a little bit of work on your fitness before you do so. So I think well, that's they really abolished that explicit fitness qualification they now have. as well, haven't they? So, they you have. know, she, she wouldn't even have to, you know, run whatever it is, two kilometres in three and a half seconds. Um, so <laughs> so that's, that's really interesting. I just thought that was, that was worth yeah. mentioning. Um, and, you know, there's... There, you know, there definitely could be well be a spot for her in that. If I was Simi Lee, I'd be a little bit concerned about that because mm. you know she's a player that's um, you know obviously was originally in the team as a bowler and then she became the captain and you know she was been playing as a pure batter for the last couple of years. I'm not convinced. I mean, she's had some good batting performances, mm -hmm. but I don't think that she's really nailed down that's where you were going to pick between Simi Lee and Donna Van Nierkirk. I, I know which one I'd pick. Oh, that's interesting. I was just thinking that actually it might give uh, Marizan Cap a little bit more longevity as well. Yeah, so there's potentially. that advantage because there have definitely been rumours over the last um, you know, year or 18 months or so that Cap might be about to retire from international cricket and go off and do the T20 franchise circuit instead. So if yeah, Dane I mean, is fighting her way back into the team, that suggests that you might get a few more years out of Marizan Cap, which is really crucial for South Africa. South Africa would certainly want that. Yeah, they would. Okay. Now, in other news this week, Sid, there's been some interesting developments in relation to Project Darwin, because we are now at a point where obviously um, the, the tender process is going on. Um, the counties have until uh, it's some date in March, so it's not too long actually to get cracking with writing their bids. Um, and actually one county in particular have come out now and said they're not planning to write a bid, and that's Worcestershire. So Ashley Giles, who's the current CEO, went on a podcast a couple of days ago and basically said, look, we're really struggling financially and we're having problems all the time because our ground keeps getting flooded. Um, so we are ruling out applying to host a tier one team. He did also say we're really excited about hosting a tier two team. And that's the kind of reaction that I guess the ECB will have been hoping for from some of the counties, just accepting, well, we're a bit of a smaller county, we're not going to get a tier one team, but we are very excited about developing that next tier down. We think that's really important. Uh, yeah, no, and I think it's an, it's an interesting development. There's, there's lots of reasons why this, you know, I, could, I could talk for hours about this. Um, but, you know, one key thing is that it means that, you know, the Edgbaston, uh, Birmingham, or Warwickshire, or however, however we're going to refer to them, they're, they're a shoe in now. They're, they, they, they will get the franchise yeah. in that area. And the ECB have kind of painted themselves into a corner here, and I understand why, by going, well, we are going to you know, take regional considerations into an account. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that leaves nobody left. Um, a few people I've seen say, oh, well, of, of course Worcestershire aren't going to go for it because they're one of the smaller counties. But I think in some ways, the smaller counties had a pretty good case. If you're Worcestershire, you know, ideally, you can say, well, for example, we, can, uh, we could have offered to host 15 games a year. Every single one of our Worcestershire women tier one games yeah. would have been hosted at New Road. And we yeah. can do that. Um, you know, Warwickshire, are Warwickshire going to host 15 games a year at Edgbaston? Or are they going to wind up building, you know, saying, well, we'll host the couple and the rest will be at the foundation ground. Now, the foundation ground is a good ground for playing cricket on. It's yeah. not a huge ground, 
but you can get plenty of them. You know, some of the players will love it, but it's, but it's boundary Lots friendly. Of boundaries, yeah. uh, it's not spectator friendly, though. It's not One of the whole points of this thing is to try, you know, the big pillar that the ECB know they're missing is spectators. It's getting spectators in. Edgbaston Foundation Ground, without significant development, is not spectator friendly. It has one toilet for spectators. That toilet is effectively shared between the, the spectators and some of the players because there's one toilet with an outside door. To get to it, you have to walk kind of past the players in a small gap through the bench. Yeah. You're walking right next to the dressing room doors. So if you're a guy, you have to walk past like this. <laughs> um, and, you know, so I mean, that just emphasises everything, really. The fact that there's, there's not really a proper spectator toilet facilities is everything that it's not spectator friendly. And you're not going to get, there's, there's, no, there's no serious car parking. Port there's a Toulouse. small car park. Yeah, I mean, we've all been there at Wormsley. <laughs> but we'd rather not be, right? Uh, there's a small car park which basically is not really big enough for anything more than the players. If 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 it's any significant number of spectators, not there's not going to be no car park yeah. in there. It's I mean, only street this park. is all this is all academic, Sid, because basically, if you're Warwickshire, I'm sorry, but you're going to be laughed out of the kitchen if you are saying that you're going to play your if you're going to that you're going to plonk your women's team to play the games at the foundation this, ground. This, this, so this They're going to have to host them at Edgbaston. Well, this was this was what's really interesting though. That um, uh, so there was a great piece by Andy Frombolton in the Cricketer, which you can go and read. It's free to read in the Cricketer on their website, um, pointing out that you know these counties now have got them over a barrel. So Warwickshire have got the ECB over a barrel here. So Warwickshire can just go, yeah, we're going to host them at the Foundation Ground. What are you going to do about it? Not give you the tier one team. But where, where is it going to go then? There's nowhere else Somewhere in the else. West Midlands for it to go. So. Are you going to have two teams in the East Midlands in that case? Well, of course you could not. do. Okay. I mean, I'm... I think that this emphasises that, there's, that there, are, it, there are going to be some challenges in this process. That's, you know. Fair enough, Sid. Fair enough. <laughs> right. Well, um, thank you, everybody. <laughs> On that bombshell. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Um, and we're really excited about the Wacker Test um, starting on Thursday. And I guess that in next week's episode, we'll be reflecting on that. See you then. Bye.